Today, we look at the state of international cricket and get a chance to talk to Essen Mani, president of the International Cricket Council from 2003 to 2006, about the health of the game today and challenges for the development of the game in Africa. They say the art of conversation is to talk about the right thing at the right time. This is the right place. You're watching The Conversation. Welcome to The Conversation, I'm Ehi Longi, and in the studio with me is cricket journalist and former editor of The Cricketer, Andrew Miller. Hello, Andrew. Hello, Ehi. Thank you? you for being here. Joining us on Skype today from Pakistan is former president of the International Cricket Council, Mr. Essen Mani. Good day, Mr. Mani. Good morning. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk with you. Let's uh, start straight away, actually, Mr. Mani, because earlier this month, you expressed grave fears about cricket's future, saying that you were more concerned about the health of the game today than you have ever been. So let's start our conversation at the top of the game, uh, where according to you, sir, half of the 10 full members of the governing body do not have enough access to funding and also enough quality cricket. Can you expa expand with us on the points you were trying to make there uh, to the audience? Yeah, sure. Uh, the two are very much interlinked. Uh, when you look at the lack of uh, funding, yeah, the, the stress of not having enough money is coming through in some countries already. Uh, you look at the West Indies, they pulled out midway through a tour to uh, India. Totally unheard of before, totally unprecedented. Uh, that was a dispute over money. You look at the West Indies team, uh, they go off and play in the IPL matches instead of playing in a high-profile series against England. It boils down to money. Uh, there's something fundamentally uh, wrong when that happens, because it's the cricket boards who develop these players, bring them onto an international platform, make them heroes or uh, role models for others, uh, and then they lose them because someone is prepared to pay them more money. So the ICC, I think, requires to demonstrate some serious leadership here to ensure that players turn out for their countries, countries are able to field the best teams that they have, um, and yes, there is an issue of money that should be recognized and a way should be found to compensate the players uh, rather than let, losing them uh, to some uh, Mickey Mouse League somewhere. Uh, that's one uh, country I'm giving you an example. You look at another one, Zimbabwe, they don't play their, pay their players on time. Uh, and there's a co continuous problem. The same happens with uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, you know, their players don't get paid for, for months sometimes. Uh, so these are very serious issues. You get uh, linked to this is the quality of cricket that is available. At the end of the day, uh, when certain teams tour a country, uh, for example, when Australia or England or India tour South Africa, South Africa will make far more money than if it was Zimbabwe or Bangladesh or New Zealand or West Indies. Uh, that's simple economics. Uh, but if you don't give countries the content uh, and, the, uh, and a fair balance of tours between the profitable tours and the not so profitable tours, the countries will never be able to become viable uh, and self-sustaining in the long term. OK, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mon, I'd like to bring Andrew in on, the, on those couple of points. I mean, it, there's a, on the face of it, very clear points. We need more money. We need better competition. From your perspective, looking at the trends of the game, um, is Mr. Mani right to express those concerns now? Are they key? present-day concerns of the game of cricket? Absolutely. They, they have never been more pressing for, for cricket. I mean, uh, the, in fact, the last time I spoke to Mr Marnie, I was doing a feature ahead of the, the World Cup, looking back to how the finances of the game suddenly exploded. And they actually happened on, on his watch. He, 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 was, he was the president who, who recognised there was a value within cricket. The trouble is that value has run away with itself since the days when it was a case of, you know, we're not going to, let's not make a loss out of the sport, which is essentially what was happening for many years before the ICC basically got itself together, got its, got, its, got its act together to market its game properly. The marketing of the game has collapsed in recent years. It's become a, it's become a, a, a game of three nations, essentially. Those, the, the big three who have, who have taken over the running of the game and the rest of the seven who, who basically take the crumbs off the table. It's, it, it's a 
desperately sad state of affairs. It all stems from money. Money does make the world go round, but it also needs to be distributed fairly in order to maintain the, the sporting integrity of, of what is ultimately a game. OK, Mr Marnie, um, I mean, you, you're being given a lot of praise there, actually, by Andrew, and congratulations to you on revolutionising the game. But isn't this part of the evolution of the game that actually maybe the traditional model, um, we've seen the, the rise of T20, for instance, as a form of the game, um, but the traditional model of the game in terms of the five-day tests, um, a country like the West Indies perhaps having a natural pool of talent because the competition of maybe football and basketball and other sort of American sports hadn't quite come as the island. Uh, Zimbabwe formerly were very organised and, and a rapidly growing cricket organisation. But isn't it just a question of economic and social trends actually overtaking the game perhaps and maybe the game needs to catch up uh, on, um, on those challenges? I think what the game is suffering from, first of all, thank you, uh, Andrew. Um, appreciate what you said. Uh, but, you know, when you look at the game and the state of the game around the world, no, it's not a matter of evolution. It's a matter of some serious destruction to some uh, very uh, fundamental pillars of the game. You can't have a global sport based on 10 countries. Uh, it's not a global sport, it's a club. Um, and you reduce that to three key countries, it becomes even worse. Uh, it's, it just will not be sustainable in the long term. What you have to do is have a vision, you have to invest, and you have to, you know, and if you do that, you will reap the benefit of that investment. If you compare the vision of the ICC compared to the vision of someone like FIFA, uh, it's, you know, it's, it, it, that is so stark. I mean, FIFA uh, had 32 teams taking part in the last World Cup. And that didn't happen overnight. They've been investing in the grassroots of a lot of countries which didn't have football as their primary sport. Take the case of the United States. In 1994, they went and staged a World Cup there. Uh, people laughed. Uh, you know, the soccer wasn't a, up there at all uh, as a major sport in the United States. But what we have today is a very viable uh, a domestic program in the US. They, the United States took part in the last World Cup. They performed credibly. And more importantly, from a financial point of view, uh, 20 million people watched every US game. That turns into a lot of money for FIFA. Uh, but you can't reap the benefits unless you invest first. And rugby is following that example. Uh, uh, of FIFA, it's got it, rugby's uh, structure is very similar to cricket in terms of the elite teams and the not so good teams. Uh, but they'll have 20 uh, countries taking part in the next World Cup. They will also be hosting the 2019 Rugby World Cup in Japan. Now that to me is vision, and that is how you globalize the game. Okay, Mr. Mani, we're going to pick up on that point, actually, because I want to see how those at the top of the game have responded to your comments and also look at some of the challenges facing associate and developing nations, especially in Africa, in terms of the game of the growth. We'll see you after the break. Welcome back to, this com to the conversation. Now, in this part, we were going to look at some of the challenges facing associate nations. But before we actually do that, uh, Andrew, you wanted to pick up on something uh, Mr. Marnie was saying uh, just before the break there. Indeed. I mean, Mr. Marnie was mentioning FIFA as, as an example of a, of a governing body that has it right, which, is, which is, sounds counterintuitive given the, the headlines it's been generating recently with the corruption scandals, the Qatar fiasco, all the other things that, that people say are wrong with the game. But ultimately, the one thing it has always had right is equality of access. You think of... Um, you talked about the 32 nations that play in the World Cup. It's not just about the 32. It's about 200 nations that, that can all believe that they could play in the World Cup. Even someone like American Samoa, I think, got mm. beaten 36-0 in a, in a qualifying event. The point is they, were, they were, could actually enter that tournament. The fact they got hammered 36-0 means, well, come back stronger next time and have a better chance. But, you know, you wouldn't get that in, in, in cricket because of the, the strange disparity between, as Mr Varney was mentioning, the, the, the club of 10 and then the associates and affiliates that, that don't really get a look in. OK, Mr Marnie, I mean, that's a fair point that both you and Andrew make there. And you've said initially that associates do need more funding from the ICC and especially more opportunities to play against full member nations. Um, using the World Cup as an example, for instance, to quote you, it should be ex inclusive, not exclusive, because the proposed changes to the World Cup, they go against that, don't they, Mr Marnie? Absolutely. You know, you cut them down to 10 teams. If knows. You see, when a country qualifies, whether it's the top associates or whether it's the bottom uh, full members, 
a number of things happen. First of all, there's suddenly the following in that country in terms of people who want to look at cricket increases dramatically. Secondly, there's a lot of support for the game from the stakeholders, from sponsors. Government funding comes into infrastructure. There's a big hype because they're very proud that a country, uh, say like Nepal or Namibia or Afghanistan or Ireland is taking part uh, in a World Cup. Uh, so once you ex exclude them, they lose the benefits of uh, taking part in an elite program, an elite event, by not having the resources that they would have received if they were, were uh, taking part or even had the opportunity to take part. Okay, the Mr. Big... Mani, I just want to ask you, you, you make some very clear points, which to me as a fan of the game, as a fan of many, many different games, seem very obvious. I mean, what's been the reaction at the top end of the game to what seems... I mean, again, you, you're, not seem, you're not proposing anything revolutionary in, in world sport. You're just proposing that cricket, as you say, follows the example of uh, football and indeed rugby, uh, who, which are now in the Olympics and what have you. So what has been the reaction you've found to, to your proposals? Look, um, the full members, what they've done is, first of all, the three countries play so much cricket against each other, they leave very little space to play against the other seven full members. Um, and the other se seven full members have to fill in big holes, so they play against each other more than they play against the top three. But all of this uh, cramming of programs into a four-year cycle or a five-year cycle means there's very little space for countries to say, let me give you an example of Ireland. England, who is sitting right next door to Ireland, will play Ireland once every two years in one 50-over match. That's all. That's all that England guarantees to Ireland. Um, the other full mem members have absolutely no appetite of playing regular cricket against uh, the, the top associate member countries. How can these countries improve in their performance? How do you expect, even if they were to qualify for a World Cup, they're not going to compete effectively because they've not had the exposure against playing against the best teams. Uh, it's really a matter of the balance of putting the game and the money in the right perspective. There has to be a balance. Uh, I think it's gone too far towards money at the moment. Okay, but Andrew, I want to come to you because, I mean, when you look at international sport, the one thing that many associations talk about is the role of uh, television, especially. Um, you look at the strength of the big three. I mean, everybody knows that Mr. Mani is referring there to England, Australia and India uh, and, and their reliance on each other to, 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 for the big ticket matches. But we look at Zimbabwe, for instance, playing Pakistan uh, for the first time uh, uh, since 2009, I think. Um, that's going to be happening. Is, is there room in the calendar for the sort of, uh, sort of matches that Mr. Mani is talking about? Or, is, or indeed, do we have to actually revolutionise a cricket calendar in order to achieve some of the goals he's espousing? Well, I think it's a bit of both, to be perfectly honest. I think there would be room if the big nations were willing to make room. I mean, we mentioned Ireland, for instance, playing that, that one match against England every two years. The, the reason they get that one match was to stop Ireland from hosting other teams within the English calendar. So you, you wouldn't have this rival, um, you know, Ireland playing Australia the same day that England play West Indies in, 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 in the same time zone. So, you know, the, there, there are certain, certain little areas in which the, uh, the, the boards are, are protecting their own interests primarily and, you know, blaming the scheduling for, for, for not being able to offer more. I mean, you know, Ireland got, I think, nine ma matches against full member nations in the four-year cycle between the 2011 World Cup, when they were one of the star teams, and beat England, of course, and the 2015 World Cup. England played nine matches in December alone. I mean, it, it, it beggars belief that, that there can be that much of a disparity. There must be a way to, to have a bit, a bit more of a common ground. Um, Mr. Mani, you've been, you, obviously you, you sat in on, on key negotiations with television, key negotiations as, uh, in your time as head of the ICC, and obviously since then you've stayed, stayed involved on the top of the game. How do we find uh, a solution, uh, you know, some sort of breakthrough to give your Zimbabwe's, your Kenya's, and indeed your Ireland's and your Afghanistan's more opportunity to play each other and also to play in meaningful matches, especially, sir, if the World Cup is going to be removed as an incentive? Yeah, you've got to... I mean, the ICC and the uh, members who um, carry weight at the ICC have to look at, the, uh, stand back and just look at the whole structure. You could do it in, in a number of ways. You could stretch the uh, four-year cycle into a six-year cycle. Um, there's still a lot of money for the full members in that. Uh, you create more space. The other is that these uh, three countries, India, England, and Australia, play each other less. Um, 
So they're not, uh, and give that opportunity to uh, play against uh, the associates and the sort of the low level uh, full members. Uh, if there's a will and willingness to uh, deal with the structure, then of course it can be done. Uh, but obviously, I mean, Zimbabwe uh, might be touring Pakistan this year. Uh, that's going to be a loss making tour for Pakistan, uh, but good for Pakistan that they've uh, invited Zimbabwe. Uh, not every tour will be profitable. If you are only interested in money, then uh, you will not make the space to play against Ireland or Namibia or Uganda or any of these other countries. OK, Andrew, I mean, Mr. Mani is making it clear there, but in perhaps less diplomatic language that you can afford, it's clearly a bad idea to, to limit uh, the access that uh, associate nations will have to a World Cup. Yeah, I mean, it's a no-brainer. I mean, if you want a, a sport to be a global event, you've got to make sure the, the globe is invited, and uh, it's not. And it, increasingly, it's shrinking away from, from that all-inclusive utopia that, that, frankly, World Cups are, are meant to be. But, you know, the bigger, the bigger elephant in the room in all of this is 2020 cricket. And, I mean, um, Mr Marney mentioned the Mickey Mouse Leagues earlier on in the show. I mean, I think, I think to, to be fair, there's nothing Mickey Mouse about the IPL anymore. It, it's a big, big business. Trouble is, it's too big. And the conflicts of interest within the IPL are um, devastating for, for cricket. I mean, I'm currently working with, with some, some uh, uh, former colleagues on, on a documentary, Death of a Gentleman, about, about the, the future of Test cricket. And, you know, they're just, the, 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 state of, the state of the governance of the game is lamentable. You've got uh, you know, Mr. Srinivasan, who's, who's, who's in charge of the ICC, who basically has Test cricket's future in his hands, has this conflict of interest whereby he stands to make a, a reasonable, reasonable amount of money if uh, Test cricket withers away to create more room for, for more 2020s because, you know, he, he runs 2020 in the Cheno Super Kings. So okay. there are all sorts Actually, of issues Andrew, We're going to pick up on that because obviously we're going to look at some, I mean, with 2020 especially, maybe that is an opportunity uh, for associate nations and developing nations to get more uh, people playing the games in their country. So we'll look at what the future holds for them when we come back after the break. Welcome back to the conversation. Now, reforms of the ICC potentially mean that a future tours program can ensure bilateral series involving all 10 uh, full members in the next commercial rights cycle, which is, for those of us that have worked this out, is from 2015 to 2023. So what that means is that none of the countries should or would receive less than they presently do from the governing body. But in light of what we've been talking about today, gentlemen, one thing that did actually come out from the last World Cup, and I think this is an important thing to understand, we've talked about football, but I want to use a rugby model where sevens rugby is actually probably more responsible for the growth of the game than the 15s model. So we saw at the last World Cup, when 2020 first came out, people asked, what is the point of the 50 over game? But listening to the, both you and Mr. Marnie, it seems clear that maybe the five day game and selling the five day game to, to associate nations and developing nations is actually a lot more of a challenge. And 2020 and uh, the 50 over game are where the future is. I mean, I want to start with Mr. Marnik. What do you see as a role of 2020 uh, in helping the growth of the game and giving the opportunity for uh, associate nations possibly to have more, more uh, competitive fixtures? Look, 2020 is part of the game and it's an important part of the game. Uh, there's no doubt about it. It's a fantastic development tool in some countries. Uh, in fact, in all countries, if you look at the audiences that are attending the IPL matches in India, or the ones that attend, um, come to the T20 matches in the, the UK, uh, or South Africa, or Australia. There are a lot of people who would not normally go to the matches, families, children, fantastic. There's nothing, nothing wrong with that. Uh, you could use the T20 format very constructively to the, take the game out to the United States. Three and a half, half hours would, would be absolutely perfect for their psyche. You could take this to China and make it a big game there uh, because, again, it's less time consuming. But let me just tell you something. Whether it's 2020 or the 50 over game, that should be always be the first step towards the longer format. Uh, Bob Woolmer used to always say to me when he was the ICC high performance manager that the associate member countries will never improve in the one day game unless they have the ability to play in the longer format. Because that's where you get time to hone your skills, to improve uh, your weaknesses. Um, so that was uh, an important point he used to make to me again and again. And the other point he used to make was that they will only improve if they play 
against the better uh, full associate members or the full members. Uh, so T20, yes, uh, I'm all for it, but it has its niche in place. Uh, it, I don't think it should be allowed to take over the game totally. Okay, that's a fair point there. Uh, Andrew, over to you, because we look at, I mean, m m m Mr. Uh, Mani makes a point there about 2020 being a more accessible game for developing markets, looking at China and the US. Uh, but looking at the last World Cup, we had record, or according to Star India, we had record online viewership, which suggests a younger demographic, uh, in keeping what Mr. Mani said there. And before, the, the question used to be, well, is there a space for the 50-over game if 2020 was so, so successful? But I guess the last World Cup showed how uh, th they are related to each other. But that's a massive opportunity for world cricket around T20 and indeed the one-day game for growth. I agree. I mean, T20 has been a good thing. I mean, in, in terms of, as you say, attracting a new market, it, it, is, it is essential. The trouble is that market is completely removed from the traditional market of test cricket. And I think test cricket hasn't helped itself, to be perfectly honest. I think, uh, I mean, if you look at the, uh, the current series going on the West Indies, I mean, the, the, the pitches are flat. The, the players, I mean, obviously we know the problems with the IPL clashing with this, with this series. Therefore, many of the big name players aren't playing. So how it, can be, how it can claim to be the pinnacle of the sport if it doesn't have the best players involved is, is difficult. Um, but I think also test cricket has refused to to learn enough from 2020 and I think what we saw in the World Cup uh, speaking purely from a technical point of view of, of the excitement and the and the lessons being learned I think previous World Cups you may have had more of a more of a leaning towards test cricket you know you know defend a bit build 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 your innings etc here you know you're, you're thrashing the ball from start to finish so that you know uh, an opener such as Martin Guptill ends up with 237 I mean how, how is that possible in a, in a 50 over game the answer is they're taking the 2020 lessons extrapolating them across 50 overs. I think test cricket needs to get more interesting, needs to get more exciting. I think test cricket too, would benefit from realising that the zeitgeist now is about 2020 cricket. You need to be entertaining, because if you're not entertaining, people aren't going to watch you in this day and age. I mean, Mr. Marnie, I'd like to bring that back to you, because obviously, in explaining uh, what Bob Orman said to you, you're talking of a, perhaps a, a rather more traditional view of, of, of uh, cricket and the fact that the test match is the ultimate arena to test yourself. But if, as Andrew said, you've got an opener scoring 237 and 50 overs, if a crowd is buzzing just when Chris Gale is walking out to the crease, uh, never mind Brendan McCullum and, and other people um, of that ilk, should we re I mean, should we go where the, where the fans want the game to go, which doesn't seem to be towards five-day cricket? Or what can five-day cricket do to bring those fans to its game? Look, these players bring their experience from the T20 matches and from the five day, uh, from the 50-over game into Test cricket. The tempo of Test cricket has improved. Uh, it, uh, the runs scored in a day are ge generally far more than they were 20 years ago or 15 years ago even. Uh, so it is. They're all related. They're all connected. Uh, there's no doubt about that. But I think I totally agree with Andrew when he says that Test cricket hasn't done itself any favors. Uh, you look at the, um, uh, some of the tour programs between countries, half of the total t series, bilateral series between full members, feature two tests or less. That's wrong. Uh, if you're serious about preserving test cricket, you have to have a minimum of three test match series. I said this before, Sri Lanka has been uh, to, India, uh, to England last year. They were given two test matches. India came along and were given five. Sri Lanka played the better cricket, but the, but the hosts were not going to get as much money uh, on television by playing five matches or three matches against Sri Lanka. So they loaded all the matches against India and played five against them. Uh, you look at a high-profile series like India-Pakistan, if they ever take, takes place, they're scheduled to take, uh, play nine matches against each other uh, later on this year, but that would feature only two test matches. Uh, and so if the pu you know, push is not coming from the ICC and the full members, then Test cricket is going to struggle. OK, Mr. Mane, I also want to ask you one more question, really. And this time I'd like to really zero in on the challenges of cricket development in Africa itself, because with South Africa being, you know, South Africa doesn't make the big three, so it has its own challenges. But how do you see um, Africa developing in terms of Kenya, Zimbabwe and the number of associate nations we've got with the challenges that you've talked about so far? Look, there's an enormous amount of potential uh, in Africa. Uh, I've got no doubt about it, and I didn't when I was ICC president. Um, I've been to, you know, I went to more countries in Africa than anywhere else because I really felt that was the future of cricket. Uh, look at, I mean, Uganda has one of the best women's programs that I've uh, come across over the years. Namibia has a fantastic children's program. 
Uh, you look at Kenya, they have had huge potential for years. Uh, but unless you put funding into these countries, unless you put resources, unless you make an investment, uh, they're not going to get to the next level. Uh, Zimbabwe, uh, you know, is at the, is the opposite scale. Uh, uh, bad governance, I think, is their major challenge. Uh, there was a time when they were performing really well and were becoming uh, sort of uh, serious full members. They were, they've gone backwards over the years. Uh, I think that comes clearly down to governance. Uh, but Af I see Africa, mm, you know, both in terms of the people who are participating in the game and playing the game, uh, especially the young people, uh, the population of Africa and the, and the love for the game there. I, s I can see a huge amount of potential in Africa. OK, well, we're going to leave it there on that upbeat note for our fans and viewers across Africa. Um, firstly, can I start with thanking you for coming in today, Andrew? Great pleasure. And of course, Mr. Mani, thank you. I understand you're a very busy Hi. gentleman. So it's been a pleasure having you on with us. Thank you for having me. OK, and for everybody else watching, this is The Conversation. So make sure you find us on Facebook and Twitter. Give us your own opinions, your own queries. And we look forward to carrying on Africa's sporting conversation.